it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Kaveh Kabusi. Did I say that right? You uh, that, well, that was perfect. That was perfect. Fantastic. And you're in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And so uh, I assume you're a huge Green Bay Packers fan. Absolutely not. I'm from <laughs> Illinois originally, Bears fan. Bears fan. I bet I bet that goes over very well in Wisconsin. People in Wisconsin, they like uh, they like the give and take of sports. They like talking a lot of BS, <laughs> and they have fun with it. So it's it's a good thing for me. I just think it's absolutely hilarious living here in Phoenix, watching a uh, the Green Bay Packers when it's like do do they not understand roofs in that town? I mean, you're watching a game and it's like a a blizzard snow. And I always wanted to film a uh, a spoof video of a dentist practicing in Green Bay, and he doesn't have a roof. And he's in there doing a root canal, and it's like snowing, and the assistants, you know, wiping frost off her, off her mask. And uh, wouldn't that they be don't hilarious? care? They don't care about the cold weather. If it's <laughs> if the Packers are on, they're going to be out there. And that's well, a great stadium too, by the way. Oh it's a yeah, great I, stadium I've, to go watch a game at. Yeah, I've lectured in that stadium a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> Lord, Lord's, no, I have Lord's Dental Studios brought me in. They, they have rooms in there oh, that yeah, overlook yeah. the stadium. It is a gorgeous stadium. It's a great stadium. Yeah, at one time I thought Lord's Dental Studio, uh, when it was ran by um, uh, Rennie Schellner. Do you remember Rennie Schellner? I don't. He I don't. was he was the uh, president and CEO of that for a long time, and he was uh, he was an amazing man because he said, you know, some labs uh, want to get customers from all fifty states, and he said, you know, I'm just going to focus on Wisconsin. And he had all these hands on over the shoulders. He'd bring in his own dentist as um, customers for feedback and this and that. And before he retired, one in every three dentists in Wisconsin was sending uh, uh, Lord's Dental Studio uh, their Crown and Bridge work. And uh, he, he was just amazing. That's like man. 20 dentists, Howard. That's like 20 dentists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it, was, it was amazing. He'd have me coming down there and uh, speak for practice. Let me read your bio. Mm. Dr. Caval has sought out specialized training in a wide range of dental issues and technology. He has attended the prestigious Las Vegas Institute for Advanced Dentistry to study techniques like veneers, porcelain crowns, and full mouth restorations. In addition to cosmetic dentistry and pain management, he is also focused on training in oral conscious sedation. Dr. Kava regularly attends and teaches seminars for dentists. Recently has been awarded his elite mastership in the American Dental Implant Association. Only 2% of the U.S., uh, 2% of the dentists in the USA qualify for membership and less than 0.2% qualify for mastership. And also has been awarded a diplomat from the Dental Organization for Conscious Sedation for his excellence and clinical abilities in sedation and implant dentistry. To better serve his patients, he is an active member in the American Dental Association, Dental Organization for Conscious Sedation, Reconstructive Dentistry Institute, as well as the American Dental Implant Association. Dr. Kabusi has helped dentists from across the United States in implementing new procedures in their offices, such as CAD-CAM, cosmetic dentistry, photography, and dental implants. He has been a featured speaker for many public groups and events <coughs> on topics such as growth and development, orthodontics, cosmetic dentistry, and oral health. My gosh, you do it all. So you're one of those... Uh, are you kind of like one of those CE junkies who like to refer nothing and just do it all yourself pretty much? No, I mean, I, I really like having um, having a broad spectrum of, of treatment we can provide for our patients, but I still refer a lot of things out. So I found the more I learn, the more I refer out specific things because the more I, the more I learn, the more I see things that I can't or don't want to do. So uh, I even had, I even hosted uh, Implant CE in Madison I invited every single oral, oral surgeon in town to come to my CE at no charge. And then uh, the ones that actually came, I, I went up and told all the dentists in the, in the audience, you know, if you're going to be placing implants, you, use these oral surgeons because they support you and they're going to they're gonna help you and you, you can build a good relationship. Uh, they're going to get a lot of cases out of you and you'll get a lot of help out of them. So... And the ones that didn't show up, they missed out. You know, it, it comes down to with specialists. I mean, you either live your whole life in fear and scarcity. You think business is a boxing match and the, the dentist across the street is your enemy. Or you think in hope, growth, and abundancy, and everybody's going to grow the pie. I mean, if you think in fear and scarcity, that dentist thinks, that oral surgeon thinks that the, the whole world is a pizza. And if you take a slice, he doesn't get a slice. He doesn't understand that you can grow the pie to where... 
each half of the pie is bigger than the the one you started with and that's right i see that with specialists from here to sydney where the orthodontists who reach out to all the referral dentists say look i know you're doing invisalign i know you're not sending it here but let's have a study club once a month and let's go over your invisalign cases and this and that and then what they find out is that the dentist wants to do crown and bridge they don't want to do all these invisalign cases they'll do some but now he's got a relationship He's the referring orthodontist, and I know one dentist in Sydney and his practice, once he started working with all the general dentists on their Invisalign, uh, he went from one location to four locations and has three oh, yeah. associate orthodontists in each one of his north, south, east, west Sydney locations, and the whole thing was built on trying to teach yeah. the general dentists in Sydney to do all their own Invisalign, and what it ended up, now he has four offices with four orthodontists in each <laughs> one, and he has a yacht. It's good for all of us. You know, I mean, before I did before I did orthodontics, I didn't refer really much out to or, the orthodontists in town. I, I referred out kids, a, a little few kids. That was about it, you know, when they when they needed it. Before I did implants, I didn't refer out a lot of implant stuff. And once I started doing implants, I started seeing all the implant cases and referring them out. I mean, it's the same with that same with everything. If, if you I, don't if you're not doing it, you're not seeing it. Yeah, I, I never referred a uh, uh, sinus lift because I in 1987 I didn't believe in them. I mean the the school said they were everyone was a you know those guys placed implants were hacks and subperiosteals and ramus <laughs> frain should be illegal and and I was I was really scared, but it was it was it was actually going to the Mission Institute and learning you know this stuff that made me start referring it and I don't want to do all my sinus lifts but you you you, you the more you learn the more you refer. Yeah. And if, if I was a periodontist or an oral surgeon, I'd be holding over the shoulders for free of charge for all the general dentists in my county and building relations oh, with yeah. them, encouraging to place them, knowing that once I had that relationship, I'd have 90% of their implant business anyway. And, and on top of that, you know, probably 95% of the people that take CE don't end up ever implementing it, right? They, they take it just to have something to do. They, they go back to their practice and then they don't do it. So you're not going to hurt yourself by teaching a dentist how to see things in their practice. And maybe they'll want to do some of the cases, like you said, but they're not going to want to do them all. And the more they understand it, the more they're going to see it in their patients. So, But it's the same thing in general, dentists, that, that whole abundancy state of mind you were talking about with growing the pie. You, know, you have some dentists that are competitive and don't want to help their fellow dentists. You know, or they they have a it's you know, it's uh it's me or you. You know, if I, I have to crush you, which is a also a horrible way to have an attitude because we all see each other's patients from time to time. You know, uh, we all see each other's patients. But there, there's plenty of patients out there. We don't have to be competitive with each other. Yeah, and, and it's just a horrible way to live and think. And and uh, I mean, are you really going to be happy when you walk around living in fear and scarcity? I mean, right. isn't life a lot more happy when you walk around in hope, growth, and abundance? Yeah, it's all about attitude. You know? So, so what's a, so these dentists uh, that you're talking to right now, um, they probably obviously don't place implants. They're probably not in the dental organization for conscious sedation, all this stuff like that. Or you, or you just graduated from school, and everybody, when they walk out of dental school, all the way back to the first dental school, University of Baltimore, every graduating class says, well, they didn't teach me everything. I, you know, they're coming out of school. Well, we didn't even do Invisalign. We didn't even place an implant. We, we didn't learn nothing. So, so what, what is um, a good step for them to go? What, what is a return on investment if you have student loans? What if, what if you're a practice in uh, Kansas and you've been flat for two or three years? What, 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 what continued education do you think? If you go out and learn this, there's a demand for this in your area, and this will be worth your time and money. Well, so, I mean, one of the things is you have to look at your patient population. If you bought a practice, like I bought an existing practice after I'd been working for a while. In the practice I bought, the, <clears throat> the dentist didn't place implants, and he had a lot of patients above 60 years old. Most, I think his average patient age was 60 or 65 or something like that. So there were a ton of missing teeth. He had done a lot of dentures. He had done a lot of flippers and things like that. So <clears throat> sedation wasn't the first thing I learned out of school. But if originally when I came out, I was in a big group practice. I was working for a big group practice. And there, there were a lot of fearful patients, a lot of younger fearful patients 
and there wasn't a dentist in that group doing sedation. So I went out and learned how to do sedation so that I would be able to do those sedation cases. When I bought my practice, there was a, a ton of patients that hated their dentures, had missing teeth, and they were older. And, you know, they, they, um, they were unhappy, but they had adapted to their situation. So when I came on board, I started doing more implants because I had all these people with uh, the need and the money. So a lot of it just depends on, on what their patient population is. And if they're just starting from scratch, which is a horrible way to start, uh, if they don't have any patients, I would focus on patient flow or learning how to, how to generate patient flow instead of dental things, learning how to manage a practice instead of learning how to spend a lot of money on equipment and things that you're not necessarily going to use. So it's got to be an individual thing, but the, the best way is to look at your patient population and say, what does my patient population need? Ask people, ask your patients. You know, that's what I did. And when you go buy a dental practice, everything they give you that's uh, from the accounting department doesn't really tell you the whole story. I mean, I, I look at yeah. some of the practices that my friends that are my age bought 20, 30 years ago, and they, they found that, you know, they loved endo and this practice was doing you know, X thousands a year, but the guy did no molar endo and was referring out, you know, a molar a week. So they looked at that right. practice and they said, oh my God, look at the hidden value. If I can go in there and do all the endo that this guy referred out. But some of the biggest ones I found was they'd go buy these uh, denture uh, labs, uh, you know, like Denture World yeah. or Denture Universe. And that's in, in some poor area of town that these guys have been making dentures forever and then they would buy that. Then they go get their fellowship in the mission studio, their diplomat, the International Congress of Oral Plantology, and have this whole patient base where they bought this this denture world for three hundred thousand. And the next thing yeah. you know, they're sinking ninety implants a month, and they got some beast that's doing between two and three million dollars a year. And yeah. and nobody looked or even thought twice of buying denture world. Hey, you know they it. it P dentists in general, we're not that we're not that sharp of a group, right? You you look at um, where the money is, and people have a hard time imagining how can there be money in this poor neighborhood in this you know denture mill, and they don't realize that yeah, poor people hate their dentures just like rich people hate dentures. So you may not be able to do you know like that uh, uh, like the high end seventy thousand dollar fixed implant supported prosthesis, but you can definitely retrofit somebody's denture for five grand easily, you know, or, or do whatever you need to stabilize a lower denture for somebody and people will be happy to pay that money. So, um, talking to the, the kids that now that are, you know, just going out of school 25, man, implants have changed from when we got out, when I got out in 87. I mean, oh, so yeah. do, do you think it's a, a lot easier <clears throat> To place implants in 2017 than it was in 1987. Well, I, I guess it determines. It, it depends on what you mean because it's a lot more acceptable now than it is probably then. When I went to when I graduated in what was it 2000 2001, we knew what implants were in dental school. We heard about them, but it was like you don't don't even think about it. You cannot do it. You better not do it. You know, it's a that's not for you guys to do. Now I think their uh, students are graduating, and general dentists all over are already doing them. So it's much more. It's going to be much more acceptable for them to go out in the world and learn how to place them and start placing them. So I think it once you don't have to hide it, you know, like some of the dentists I know that come to that have been to courses I've been at or talked at, they're afraid. One of the big things they're afraid to do is they're afraid to start placing implants because they're afraid that they'll ruin a relationship with the oral surgeon or or the other people will find out about it. But I think the kids coming out of school, I don't know how much they learn about implants in dental school. It might be like it was when I was in school and you didn't really learn anything about it, but I think it's going to be much more accepting for them to get out and start learning and placing and doing things like that. So, so they're afraid to place the implant because they're afraid of fear. They're afraid that if they 
learn how to place an implant, their oral surgeon or periodontist get mad. If they learn how to do Invisalign, their orthodontist would get yeah. mad. Or if so, they make a mistake that the specialist will throw them under the bus, you know. And and so social animals live in uh, social context all the time. And that's why, you know, 99% of people like to uh, not be transparent, fly below the radar, not be seen or heard. Only about 1% of sapiens are completely natural, flying above the radar, posting, lecturing, talking, because they yeah. really don't care if you agree or disagree. They just have fun sharing. So so what advice would you give to that dentist in a small, let's let's go to a redneck part of the America. Let's go to, you know, a red state like Texas, and he's in a small town of uh, 25,000 in Texas, and this really frightens him. What, what advice would you give him? So what, I, what I'd say is, <clears throat> Go to the specialist in your town. This is what I tell people because this is what I did. I before I did ortho, I went to the ortho. I'm a, I'm in a place with like a million dentists in Madison. Madison's a nice place to live, so we got millions of dentists. Not not literally millions, power, but we got a lot of dentists. We got a lot of specialists, and so I went to the orthodontist that I was using, the the few orthodontists, and I said, hey, I'm going to start doing some cosmetic orthodontics for adults. What I'd like from you is I'd like. I'm going to, I know I'm going to be seeing more patients coming in that need orthodontics that I don't feel comfortable providing. So I want to refer them to you, but I want you to help me with the cases that I'm, I want to do. <clears throat> Give me some guidance, have problems, help me out and, and be, and like mentor me. And the same thing when I started placing implants, when I started placing implants, I went to some of the specialists in town and one of them was not, <laughs> not the most helpful. He was like, oh, you should not do this. You're going to get in problems, blah, blah, blah. And I, I said, well, well, that's why I want you to help me. And he still wasn't that helpful. But so I said, all right, fine. If it's his loss. And I went, we you know, ended up developing relationships with other world surgeons in town and in the surrounding communities. And uh, it's only been good for me and it's only been good for them, really. So that's what I would tell them to do. And if you're in a small town where there's like one oral surgeon or if you're in an isolated community, <clears throat> Hell, there's a lot. You probably know there's a lot of communities that don't have specialists. So if you're a general dentist, you have to be doing that type of work. You then you find somebody that can help you remotely, or find somebody in the nearest community, and you, you say, you know, the say exact same thing. Say, I'm going to be doing this, and I want you to help me with it. And the only the only way to have success is by being open, because uh, if you're hiding things, you're not going to be successful. Because when you have a problem. You, you're isolated. I mean, that's the whole theory of dental town. You never have to practice alone again, right? So I found all my all my mentor, my uh, ortho mentor. I found on dental town. Uh, I actually found him through my implant mentor, who I also found on dental town. So and and all this is from people uh, being open and helping each other because I figure I don't have to make all my own mistakes. I can have other people that made mistakes that I can learn from, and that's the that's the best way to go. I I believe. And, you know, Dental Town, I mean, if you could sum it up the most in the one word, it's the people who just are hardwired to share. I mean, it's like if you go to an AA meeting, no one's going to throw you under a bus for doing what they did. I mean, you go to an AA meeting and it doesn't cost you money to get in and they're not paying the person next to you. It's, it's sharing from the heart. And when you go to Dental Town, these are people, I mean, that's what Dental Town is. It's dentistry's AA meeting for all these guys to come on and say, Hey, I'm a dentist. I messed up. I placed a crown and it, it, you know, went south and, and everybody's not there to throw you in your bus or they're, they're all there to help. I mean, I, I just think it's right. the, the coolest thing of getting all the sharers on one page oh, yeah. to help each other. That's fantastic. I mean, you don't, you, you literally, I wouldn't be placing implants the way I, the way I started if it hadn't been for dental town. I found our Nazarian, uh, <clears throat> who's a townie, uh, in Detroit. In, in Detroit, yeah, and uh, uh, he was fantastic. I actually, I was placing implants before I found him, but I just started placing implants by myself, Howard. Is, <laughs> he, just, is he a friend of yours? Uh, yeah, I consider him a, a, a really great friend. E email email him and uh, and CC me, Howard, at downtown.com. That'd be the most rocking hot podcast. I love that guy. He's awesome. Yeah, he, He's I mean, been he would awesome love to do for it. 20 years. Or Is he as old as me? Is he, how old is he? I'm 54. I don't know. You know, he looks like he looks like Mr. Clean, but when he was like 30. So I don't know how old he is. Yeah, he, he's an amazing dentist. That's cool. OK, so let, let's go more specific. So you're talking to a dentist right now and they've yeah. never placed one. I mean, 
How do you go from I never placed an implant to I did one? T talking through baby steps, what would you do first? <laughs> There's so many ways you can do it. I mean, the way I did it is not the way I recommend doing it. Because I was I was working for a big group, and I was um, they they asked me to head up one of their remote offices, right? So I was in a little town, kind of far away from everybody, and I noticed there were, the previous dentist had would do a lot of dentures, like you were talking about, and so there were all these patients that were really uncomfortable with their dentures, and I realized, well, it should be easy to sink a couple mini implants. <clears throat> so I went to. Um, like an overnight course, you know, where you fly in, you sink some on a model. And I went back to my office and uh, I had lined up a few patients beforehand. I said, look, I don't know really, I've never done this before, but it seems pretty straightforward. And uh, I think I can put a couple implants here that we can, you know, drill out your denture and snap your denture into. And uh, I got a few takers and I said, don't get mad at me if I screw you up. Cause I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> this will be the first couple I'm doing. So the, the first person I did it on um, was a schizophrenic with multiple personalities. And I just, she had just come in my office one day with the problems with the dentures and she didn't put any of that on her health history form. So I never, I never, uh, never worked on her before. And uh, she came in with a different personality than I had met, a totally different name and everything than I had met previously. And that was probably the worst patient to start doing that on. So I would say don't, uh, but, it, but totally successful. Worked out great. She loved it. And to, it's been like a decade and she still has her, everything's functioning. The best way to start out is to start out with a mentor. So if you're going to do your first one, you find somebody that uh, that's local to you that can come in and help you out with it or come in and watch you do it and help you get your setup right and all of that. That's the best way to do. Uh, you know, the second best way is to go to one of these institutes where you can go and uh, you go through a continuum and then go travel to a remote location and start just doing a bunch of them. They have mission trips and things like that where you can just start doing them. Uh, and then uh, the great way, so I started placing implants just by myself, but I knew there was a lot that I wasn't understanding. So. I found Ara, Dr. Nazarian, on Dental Town, and I said, Ara, I've got, I'm placing implants, but I'm not real comfortable with it. There's a lot I don't understand. So he had me go to some of his courses, and then he came into my office, and we set up, I think, like something like a dozen implants over a Friday, Saturday morning. And he just, we, we went through all the cases beforehand, all the x rays and models and everything, planned them all out together. And then he flew into my office. And we lined up the patients and just went through and did them. And they, we did all kinds of procedures. We did uh, just a bunch of stuff. And then uh, later on, I went through Dr. Garg's continuum. So Dr. Garg and Dr. Mish are like contemporaries for people that don't know. And uh, Dr. Garg was great, too. He's a fantastic guy. He's Miami, but his courses are in Dominican Republic? Well, he does. So he does courses across the U.S. You know, like... Um, like Dr. Mish is kind of located in Detroit, and now he's got kind of a uh, he another headquarters at Glidewell in California. How how's Carl doing? <clears throat> What's that? How's he doing? Dr. Mish? Yeah. I, I don't know. Do our uh, Dr. Nazarian could probably tell you because I know he sees him a lot more. I don't know. I know he was sick for a while, but I think he's I think he's recovered. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. I don't really. I never met him. So, um, but Dr. Gard does classes across the U.S. So he'll do like an East Coast, he, they, the, his beginning continuum's four courses, and they're geared towards helping you produce and set up. They basically pay for themselves the way he's got it set up. Arun so, Garg. Arun Garg, yep. Yeah. And he's a fabulous guy. I don't know how he does it. He looks like he's 40 years old, and he stands up and talks for, you know, days at a time. And uh, he's the nicest guy, and he's really geared towards, he's one of the only, you know, those big speakers. It's hard you know, it's weird if you can actually get in touch with one of them, but he's totally open um, to communication. He'll take your phone call, take your email, whatever. And he's just really wants his students to succeed. So I and took he's got his a great uh, name for his website, implantseminars.com. That's fantastic. If and you, have, and you, know, if you really have to write class. that one down, you're drinking. <laughs> implantseminars.com. I mean, that's uh, how easy to get. Arun Garg is an amazing man. He's great.
He's, He's great. Amazing. And they'll come to your office too. And Him what? Or his staff, they will come out to your office. I mean, you have to pay for it, but they will come to your office and, and go over things with your team. He's got... <clears throat> Um, he's got other doctors that work for him. So, you know, you'll go to his courses, there'll be, you know, like 200 people in an auditorium, but then you do hands-on and he has experienced specialists and doctors that will come, um, come and give you one-on-one -on -one attention. And those doctors can come out to your office. He'll come out to your office. It's a, it's a really great way. And then they go to the Dominican Republic and you'll place like 30 to 50 implants. And how do you spell the uh, Nazarian's name? How do you spell his Nazarian, name? Nazarian, N-A-Z-A-R-I-A-N. And it's Ara, A R A. Um, he's had some pretty big threads on DT, but oh yeah, he's 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 always you know he, he's a full time practicing dentist in his office. He's in Troy. Is he in Troy, Michigan, or? Uh, it's like a suburb of Detroit. I know when I fly into Detroit, I take a cab out to his offices on Big Beaver Road. Well, do you know uh, is he um, is he Michigan Reconstructive Implant Dentistry dot com? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's got a great area on his website just for dentists, and it's got resources and and courses. And he started the uh, Reconstructive Dental Institute. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, and you've been to those courses too. Yeah, yeah. He, he does speaking for a lot of different implant systems, so he's not uh, he's not you know a salesman type person. He's just he just wants you know if you go to his courses, he wants you to succeed and. Dr. Nazarian's fantastic. I think uh, I, it was. It must have been about seven years ago or eight years ago that I first met him. So, so what? Um, so what implant system does the Rungar, Did he come out with his own implant system? His own implants, or um, what? what he is doesn't. There? Uh, when you go to his courses, he doesn't uh, recommend any particular system. So he'll have. <clears throat> You know, different implant manufacturers there, but he doesn't say use this one opposed to this one. He, he kind of talks about how you should find your own system that you want to use, and he goes through the benefits and drawbacks to the different styles of implants. And um, so he doesn't he doesn't really have a system that he uses or advocates. At least not when I took his continuum. Dr. Nazarian will teach courses for different implant manufacturers, but he's also not one that that. Uh, you know, it won't limit you to one system because I know I've seen cases of his with all kinds of different implants too. Well, the system I'm going to recommend from just, you know, I, I like to look at, you know, who's successful. And when I look at everyone who's successful, they did, this is the most common formula. They found a dental implant uh, company mm -hmm. that had a rep in their, a, a human rep, not buying them online from, yeah. Russia or Israel or Pakistan, they, they actually had a human that was in their town. And then that human told them which periodontist and implantologist thought in fear and scarcity and which ones were thought in hope, growth and abundance, arranged yeah. a lunch with those. Then the next thing you know, those three are eating lunch at Subway. And then the next thing you know, this dentist, they're looking at each other's schedules. and They say, I, I don't have any patients Tuesday from two to four. And then the periodontist says, okay, I'll schedule a easy singular, you know, replacing a molar. And, and next yeah. thing you know, the three of them are the three musketeers and they're all in this together and it's the cheapest, it's the lowest cost and it just gets done. I mean, I remember talking to Tarun Agro, I say, you know, you, 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 I mean, Tarun is a, a, likes to, you know, save money. He's a smart man. I'll say, why do you use Noble BioCare? They're the most expensive implants out there. Like four hundred dollars an implant. Yeah, he says because I love the rep. You know, it's a relationship. Um, you know, and they give me volume discounts anyway. But you know, it, she helps me in so many areas. It just, just gets done. Yeah. And you know, I if you want to save a buck and then never place an implant, it's not going to happen. You need to be smart about it, and you need to, those relationships. So I like the one in the backyard. Mm -hmm. But if you can't do that in your own town, then you're you saying like go see Noble BioCare. That's the one you like. What's that? You said Nobel BioCare is what no, you no, like. No, I said I like the one. I mean, titanium, is titanium. I don't really, I don't really think your osteocytes are sitting around caring if it's it was made by <laughs> right, Nike or is. Reebok or whatever. I, 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 I think just the relationship. If you have a human rep in your in your city, and she points out the ones that will um, love to meet you and help you, that's yeah. low cost, over the shoulder. You got somebody you can go over the train plan with. 
you have less fear because if it goes south, you got a buddy that can bail you out. And, you know, the, and then when you leave that, then the high cost way is to get in an airplane and fly somewhere and then go to an institute. And then you go back to your town and you have a patient, you know, they're, they're not going to be there in your backyard. I mean, I, th- I think the, yeah. the best is to start with a periodontist or oral surgeon who thinks in hope, growth and abundance in your, in your backyard with a rep that can be there at the last minute if you need someone. Oh, totally. or, yeah. And then, you know, if, um, if you have somebody that can come to your office and help you, then your staff is getting to, they're, get, they're getting the benefit of learning how to do the, the stuff as well. Like, you the know? Me- like the mega gen rep in Phoenix mm-hmm. probably knows more about implant surgery than probably anybody in the whole state of Arizona. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, it's just amazing. <clears throat> he, he, he's watched more surgeries than probably anybody that's placing implants because, I mean, even if you place a lot, I mean, he's, I mean, he, he's, he's watching surgeries all day, every day for a decade. Yeah. They've probably seen everything, every problem I'm going to ever have. And yeah. they know how to deal with it or how somebody else dealt with it. Yeah. So, and and yeah. again, and again, to get rid of that fear, he knows who the good guys are that if you have a problem or something goes wrong, let's, let's go talk to this guy. Well, it's just like we were talking about it. It's all communication. So if, if there's no support and the implant system only costs 50 bucks, you know, but you're going to have problems, you're going to have to get in contact with somebody to help you solve the problem. So if there's no rep or no support, you don't want to go with that system. So you, um, so you do recommend joining the American Academy of Implant Dentistry? Was that a good move for you? Yeah, I think it's really good. They, they've got great, it's a support network, kind of like Dental Town. They have an online forum you can go on. Um, you know, uh, if you have questions about the courses especially, it's a great place to be. You know, if you're, you just got home from a course, you get a, you get a, you're going to have 200 other people that were just at the course. Uh, or access to the instructors and things like that, they can help you out with it. It's a, I think it's a good thing. It's not an expensive uh, group to join. There's something, I don't know, it's, like, uh, it's got a really big membership too. So so what, what actual implant do you actually place? So most of what I place is uh, from Oseo Biomedical in Albuquerque. Albuquerque, New Mexico. And that's uh, Dr. Delise. It was original, originally the O Company. I think he patented the uh, O connection for dentures or for dental uses. So that's what it started out with. I think in the 70s and 80s, it was the O company. And then he got into implants. And Dr. Delise has been playing, placing implants for like <laughs> it's like 40 years. or 50 years, something 50. like that. Yeah, blade implants, I think, originally. And uh, he's got a really interesting presentation of the way implants were done back in the day. So... Uh, but you know, you know, he's a you know nice my, guy. the first implant cases I watched were all subperiosteals, ramus yeah. frames, blades, and like I tell these, then and I, I like to tell the story because a lot of those early pioneers, when they finally had a case that failed, lost their license, and it was so sad to watch them yeah. just emotionally implode and end up living. I'm dead serious, living on the edges of town in a trailer up in Apache Junction. And, oh, that's and, horrible. Yeah, I, I know it's 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 incredibly horrible, and I like to keep reminding that story because, um, you know, it's the same problem, different day. There's people being hung up to dry today for new new things, and I always like to add a historical perspective that in the '80s, anybody placing implants, subs, and range frames was a quack, and we are standing on their shoulders today. And a lot of those pioneers paid a huge price for that. Like going yeah. from being a rich dentist to living in a trailer, um, you know. Don't ever be the first person to do something, uh, right? Especially because that, that, that you're going to learn lessons the hard way. I mean, it's it, always nice group, when somebody's done it before you. Every group's the same. They're always the hardest on their own family member. You know, they'll, you know, I got five sisters. They'll be ten <coughs> times madder at their sister for doing something small, but their best girlfriend does something ten times worse, and they, they get a pass. I mean, dentists are hardest amongst on on themselves. Well, they say, you know, you, there's that whole continuum of, of, uh, of improvement, right? The first person to do something, people say they're a quack or they're crazy uh, or it doesn't work. <clears throat> and then over time, you build up evidence and, and proof that it works. And then the group says, oh, yeah, well, we always knew that it, it worked. 
and then it becomes mainstream, right? So when you talk about the dental organization for conscious sedation, that's docs, right? Yeah, I yeah. love that. It's funny. I know it as docs. I, I, uh, I very rarely see it as a dental organization for conscious sedation, <laughs> uh, but it's docs. <laughs> So, That's what um, it stands for, yeah. So what percent of your implant surgeries do you use some form of conscious sedation? Uh, actually, mostly not. It, it's mostly not. I would say it's an insignificant uh, portion of my implant cases. So, uh, um, you know, I'd say probably less than 5%. So we do a lot of guided surgery for implants. So whenever I can, I try to do... Uh, the least invasive type of surgery. We'll lay flaps or do things like that if we need to. But if I if I can, I'll put somebody in like a treatment denture first, let them heal up, and then go in with a uh, tissue punch or something like that. Um, so I like, you know, I like it because most of my implant patients don't need more than a little bit of ibuprofen that night, and then they're fine. And a lot of them would say that it was easier than getting a crown prepped or a fillings done. So uh, very few of my implant cases are sedated. And very few of them are, you're giving them any more, anything more than ibuprofen? No, I, I always give people a prescription for pain medication, but it's pretty rare for anyone to actually need it. Because I always ask, <clears throat> you know, when we do a follow-up a day or two later, I always ask them how was everything. Um, and some some will use the pain medication because because they were worried about it. But the vast majority say, oh, I just took some ibuprofen when I got home. You know, that's a, another historical <clears throat> funny perspective because when I was little, uh, the press was very mad at doctors in the 80s and 90s because you had all these patients needlessly suffering from pain because the mean old doctor wouldn't give them pain medication. And yeah. it was a big guilt trip by the media. So finally, the doctors started opening up and said, okay, here's Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycontin. And now it comes all the way to the other, other side. Way. Now they're like, you bad doctors, 41,000 Americans died from an opioid overdose, and, and it's all because of the bad doctors prescribing this stuff. So, you know, the truth is always in the middle. There's always a balance. But I, I think this year, 2016 was the year Prince died, right? Was yeah. it this year? Yeah, and it was I, year. I think that really put uh, opioid prescriptions on center stage. And now a lot of doctors are thinking, well, maybe you shouldn't routinely give Vicodin after every root canal and implant and wisdom teeth. Well, I'll tell you, I still, I, I'll give people the prescription and I'll tell them you may, may not, you may or may not need it, but you have it because now with the rules, you can't give people, you can't call in the prescription for them. So if they're at home and they're, you know, have unanticipated pain, um, the rules have basically made it stupid. I can't call in a pain medication for somebody having pain. So I just give them a prescription, the written prescription. I say, don't fill it unless you need it, but here now at least you have it. And in economics, we call that the law of unintended consequences. They they wanted to make it so you couldn't call it in without a paper right. trail. And what was the consequence? That now the doctors give everyone a prescription so that in case they need it, since right. they can't call it in, you already have the paper at home. I mean, you can still call in, I think, what, Tylenol-3. Uh, but a lot of patients, I, I, I have a lot of patients that can't take Tylenol-3. They can't take the codeine or they can't take the Tylenol. Or so, one of the two. So you went with the uh, OCO Biomedical out of Albuquerque. That was your implant of choice. Yeah, but I've used uh, maybe five or six different systems. So there, I mean, there's a lot of good implant systems. I like OCO for a number of reasons. I like them because this Dr. Delise, you know, developed it. He placed a ton of implants going way back. So he had something in mind as a general dentist. He wanted a system that was really simple. And that was stable right off the bat. And what he designed, uh, they have stabilization from the tip. They have he's they got a patent on the bulogger nose. It's pretty cool. You can actually screw it into your finger, and it just will hang from your finger. And then the other part of the dual stabilization is threads <clears throat> um, up at the top of the implant that will engage the cortical bone. So they go in like rock solid, um, super and, and it's, they just, it's an they just switched out their uh, their lead dentist uh, surgeon trainer. They right? did. They've had a, they've had a few different people. So, but they're all they're all good trainers. Who's, who's their latest one now? You know, I don't even know. I don't know. Yeah, not sure. I, I do know that they just started a continuum. So they used to just have 
they used to, used to have a beginners and an advanced course, but I think in 2017, they're going to actually have a continuum of like three or four courses. So Dennis can start with like a beginning course and bone grafting and stuff like that and work their way up to advanced placement. And that's OCOBiomedical.com. Um, so of those other five or six systems that you use, was that, was that, what, what did you really learn from using five or six other systems? My question is, does it really yeah. matter what kind of clubs Tiger Woods is using? I mean, I'm pretty sure yeah. if Tiger Woods was handed a baseball bat, he would beat me on the golf course. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, do you do you think the implant system is with a shovel? Like, do do you think it's kind of like uh, implants? Is like, that does it really matter what Tiger Woods golf club is? I mean, do you think it really matters what clubs Tiger Wood is using? If they're selling it, no. if they're you selling know, them, you basically hit the nail on the head. Success with implants has a lot to do with experience, right? When you're starting out, <clears throat> you're going to be inexperienced. And the most important thing is case selection, right? And as you learn, uh, as you get more confident and learn more, you have to still be careful about case selection. So Tiger Woods could probably beat both of us using a garden hoe, right? Like that guy in Tin Cup. Remember that movie? Uh, <laughs> but with us, um, so out of the different systems I used, I don't want to spend a lot of money. You know, Dennis, our implants just piss me off because everything's proprietary. You can't use a driver from this system with this company. You know, you can't. It, it just it, it just can get super expensive and ridiculous and stupid. I wish they would just pick one universal system and go with it. But what I learned was that uh, that basically everything works, and that uh, the most important thing is your comfort level using the system. A couple of the systems I used were really uh, a lot more complicated to use. And that's why I like the OCO system because it's it's really simple, and yet you have a lot of restorative options. And some of the systems I used were very uh, they they had a, a lot of complex things that you had to do just to put an implant in, um, but they, they all work. So what I found was I went with the system that I liked that had the most support, and that uh, was the most cost effective, and I found that to be OCO Biomedical. It's, you know, it's it's not going to be right for everyone, but it was it was certainly a good choice for me. It allowed me to keep my pricing competitive, so that uh, you know, because if you're going to be spending five six hundred dollars on an implant, it's it means your pricing is going to have to be a little higher. And I wanted my pricing to be competitive. And then, like you said, some some implant systems they don't have a presence in your area. Uh, I have a rep in my area comes out to my office. Um, and, you know, and the support's important, too. So I can get Dr. DeLise on the phone if I have to. So, You know how you were talking about how, uh, you know, you wish implant systems were more interchangeable? Yeah. The most ridiculous thing is the, uh, the different, the number of different batteries that you have to sell. You know, you're, I mean, it's a round one. I mean, how many batteries do yeah. they sell at Radio Shack today? Yeah, I mean, that's, that is really ridiculous. But it's their business model. Yeah. I mean, remember when we were little, they gave away the sh at college. When you're a boy and check in the dorm, they gave you a free shaver. They gave you the free handle because then you would be buying the heads. You had to the buy the heads, life. yeah. So they give away the shaver, and then you have to buy and then they get you buying the blades for the rest of your life. And then one day you're sitting there thinking, why Why are these blades cost more than drugs? I mean, I mean, it's just crazy. So now you see the switch yeah. back to the single the single blade. Where they're saying, you know, why do you really need five blades, and do you really want to pay, you know, a gazillion dollars just to shave your face when you go to There's a professional so many examples barber? Of that. Yeah, yeah, when so you go many to a professional barber, I, they're single blade. Yeah, I hate proprietary BS. You know, just to lock you in, like uh, you know, when you used to buy a computer and they throw in a free printer. Ooh, I get a free printer, so I have to buy the super expensive ink. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that that is the business model. Get yeah. you in and then uh, abuse you the rest of your life. Um, you, you've been around the block several times. Uh, if, if I ask dentists, you know, what, what keeps you up the most at night? Inside their office, it's always HR. It's always their employees or patients. It's always people problems. But if you say, no, let's leave. Not, we're not talking microeconomics. We're talking macroeconomics, the dental industry as a whole. 
a lot of people say, well, it's like Walgreens and pharmacists. We're we're all dead by corporate dentistry. Do you do you think the solo practicing dentist is dead? Do you think corporate is going to slay all the dragons? Well, it's 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 certainly changing, isn't it? <clears throat> I mean, when I when I graduated from dental school, it was the cosmetic boom. You know, we had those shows like The Swan and all those things where you know, Dr. Dorfman was doing cosmetic dentistry and somebody was getting their boobs lifted and a tummy tuck and all that stuff. And people that had was access. Me. <laughs> that was me. The Were you on the swan? The boob job and the veneers by oh. Dorfman? I, I was the patient. Well, we, but, but you know, like people had access to money. They might not have had money, but they had easy access to money. And so I graduated from dental school in the most unrealistic, uh, you know, environment ever because people would come in and they'd want really elaborate dental procedures and they, they had the access to money to get it. And then I started taking these courses and learning how to do that stuff and the bottom dropped out of the economy. We had like bubble after bubble and, you know, people lost houses. They, the access to money went away. And so all of a sudden you had people, I mean, that started a trend that's continuing of adults not going to the dentist. So is the solo practice dead? I don't think it's dead, but it, it's got to change. It's got to evolve along with the economy and along with the environment. You know, we have people with actual business acumen buying dental practices. Why are they buying dental practices? Is it because they, they don't know how to make money, Howard? I don't know. What do you think, Dr. Fran? Well, I think that, you know, when you look at the S&P 500, the average profit margin is 5%. I mean, one nickel on a dollar. They look at dentistry, they say, my God, they, they have 35% profit margins. Uh, the grocery store industry, like Kroger, I mean, when you buy a dollar's worth of groceries, they net a penny, a 1%. So the margins are so huge <coughs> that they just think, my God, with margins that big, how, how could you lose? So well, when you look at the grocery store, I mean, we just went through Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, the loss leaders in the grocery stores, you know, the, the, the turkey, they, they don't make a dime on that. They lose about 50 cents on the pound with those. They're, they're in the negatives with selling turkeys at Thanksgiving. But they know that people are going to come in. They're going to buy cranberry sauce and booze and this and that. When when I went uh, in, in this, it's the same thing with ham during Christmas, like the Christmas ham. They lose money on that. You know, they're paying like what, a dollar a pound and they're selling it for 79 cents a pound. Uh, that's an incredible loss. And then the, and other, the other thing, compare it to grocery. What's the cheapest thing you sell in your office? I mean, what's what if I could just buy the cheapest thing? What would it be? A PA? Yeah. And how much is the Something PA? Like uh, how much is a PA? Twenty nine dollars, I think. Yeah. What what are the what are they selling in a grocery store for twenty nine dollars? I mean, the 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 oh. cheapest thing we sell in a dental office is the most expensive entree at a restaurant, and yeah. there's nothing that expensive in an entire grocery store. You know, I mean, uh, it's uh, so that well, we got to be smarter about it. You know, we got to be we have to be smarter. We have to be better because you can't uh, you can't run a practice anymore on a wing and a prayer. And just, you know, for instance, if you look at how is that a Bon Jovi fast, song, I think it, I think it, <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> but if you look at just in my collection. area, what's that? You just gave away your record collection. With I that know. Thing. I'd have to find a record player now. I can't do that. So, but if you just look at my area recently. You know, we have a lot of big local dental groups, right, that'll have, you know, like 20, 30, 50 dentists. And they're local. They're local groups. And for the most part, they're good. You know, they're as far as I know, we get along pretty – dentists in Madison, I think, get along pretty well um, for the most part. And these groups, they're, they're local. They're people that grew up here, started practices, merged them, and now they've got some big ones. Well, one of them started uh, a dental insurance company because – they, we, you know, we get locked in as dentists to doing commodity dentistry. And, and so they said, well, if dentistry is a, com I don't know if this is the, what they, what they said to themselves, but they were smart. They started their own insurance company and they were able to sell it to the state and the city. Well, I'm in Madison, the capital of Wisconsin. So we have the state government and the city government, and the university here. So overnight, you know, there is about 40% of the population that had dental insurance that uh, that could only go to this group. I mean, they locked it up. It was nice. It was great. Uh, they invited a few practices in, but for the most part, you had to go to see them. And so that really didn't hurt my practice too much initially. 
I had about 18 patients the oh, first year that had it. Name, what's the name of that group? <clears throat> I'm not going to say the name of that group. Oh, I don't want to say uncensored. I mean, they didn't do anything illegal. They didn't do anything illegal. They were smart. That was smart. But my point is, <clears throat> well, some will of these you, will you email me the name. I'm just curious. Yeah, sure. I would Howard, Howard at dentaltown.com. Definitely. Okay. So I lost 18 patients that first year. They, they said, hey, I'm sorry, but I, I don't have to pay anything if I go here, so I'm going to go. Out of those 18, pa the initial patients, 17 came back for their next cleaning because they liked our experience. But the following year where it killed people was when patients are going to find a place to go. They call your office and say, well, do you take this insurance? You say no, and they move on. You know, um, you have no chance then with new patients. So with my practice, it didn't it didn't hurt us too badly. But there were some practices that were maybe seventy percent, you know, the, near the capital. There, near seventy percent of their patients ended up having this insurance. So that's how fast it can change. I mean, that's one year. Uh, it can flip things around. And you know, you see with the current economy, less and less adults are going to the dentist. So in uh, there was an article in the. Um, the ADA journal or something that 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 um, showed how it was affecting um, in general how it was affecting dental, dental incomes. So and it's not an insignificant amount. It's like forty or fifty thousand dollars in the past decade that uh, dental take home incomes have decreased. Yeah, it so, maxed in two thousand five at two hundred and nineteen thousand, and now yeah. it's down to one seventy four. It's dropping four thousand dollars a year. It's dropped forty thousand. From 2005 yep. to 2015, and their head economist, who comes from the World Bank, um, says it's that that trend is not changing. It's still going down. It's still the same, yeah. And and you know that. So that's that's a long-term trend change. In Madison, we had a very short-term change. <clears throat> so uh, you know, you you just have to be able to pivot, and you have to be able to see these problems at a time and counteract them and come up with a way to um, to be able to bypass it. In my office, we've tried to bypass it because who knows what's going to happen with dental insurance. So we've tried to build up our non-insurance population and we have a loyalty program that patients that don't have insurance can um, can participate in. So we are, we're about uh, between 40 and 50 percent of our patients don't have dental insurance. Uh, and most of those patients are involved in our loyalty program. So they get benefits from doing that. Uh, it's not dental insurance. It's just a program we have. Uh, there's and there's ones you can join like Quality Dental Plan and things like that or QD. I don't know. It's another townie that started something like that that you can join, uh, and they send you like an out of the box program you can implement in your office. I think loyalty programs are more important for the long run than advertising and marketing programs because oh, I agree. people, people yeah. that advertise the marketing they're just always burning and churning. I mean, oh. if, you look, if you look at a hygienist who works 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, 2,000 hours a year, she can only clean 1,000 people's teeth twice a year. So then you look at 25 new patients a month. Okay, so you're adding a hygienist every three and a half years, right? So every decade you have three but hygienists. But that never happens, does it? It never happens. Their hygiene capacity never changes, and they yeah. still keep burning and churning patients. But then the big boys, <clears throat> Amazon Prime, Costco, Sam's Club, you have to buy a membership, and they think, loyalty programs they're like we're not gonna let anybody off the street you want to shop at costco you want to sam's club you want to amazon prime you got to be a member because they know once they have a loyalty program with you you stay with them for the long run so what 100%. is your loyalty program did you did you have someone help you set it up or did you set it up yourself we set it up ourselves and we use the legal aid through the uh, wisconsin dental association to make sure we weren't breaking any laws <clears throat> so we created a plan and I had seen, um, I had seen somebody had, there's a thread on dental town with one. So when I started my practice, I said, I'm going to do that. Um, but it, you had to pay for that program and I'm a cheap state. So what was that? I, QDI? I just, what's that? What, what was the one on online on dental town? Was it QDI? I, it's something like that. Uh, quality dental plan at QDP, I think, or quality, maybe it's quality something. It's uh, one of the townies that did it. Right, and you can go into their website and and start your own, and they help you with marketing. Apparently, I think I didn't use that plan um, because I, I was just doing a startup, and I was didn't want, didn't want to pay for it. But so I did my own, and it's it's wildly successful, you know. Um, 
And I doubt it's probably very different from what they did. But there are a few things you have to do to be in compliance. You're you talking about be, Townie Dan Murat. Dan yeah, Murat, I think that's his name. Out of uh, Oregon, qualitydentalplan.com. Um, mm -hmm. And that is... Uh, he's, and he's uh, got everything all figured out. I mean, he's really gone for it, and you get a really nice package, I think. Uh, and like I said, I didn't go through his, but it, it's probably not that different. You have a membership fee um, for patients to get access because you really want the lawyer... You know, once somebody's a member of some something, they tend to go back and they tend to spend more. Uh, and then once you have once you have people coming back, like you said, if He's, if you get twenty five new patients a month, why why don't you need to add a, a new hygienist every year? It's because you lose people out the back door. And so part of that is you have to be good at the customer service to keep them there. But that's just another carrot. The the loyalty program is just another carrot. And he must have moved. When I met him, he was out of Oregon, and now I see he's in <coughs> Reno, Nevada. So I wonder. Maybe he uh, retired. Life's good. Or if you're... <laughs> maybe maybe the corporation lawyers wanted it under errors under uh, Nevada law. Nevada, yeah. I mean, look, look at the S and P five hundred. They almost all have to be out of Delaware because they're because uh, it's they, tax uh, favorable. Uh, well, it's actually all the the courts and the laws, the state laws, are pro corporation. So mm -hmm. any any corporate lawyer is going to tell any public trading company, dude, you got to be out of Delaware, or you have so many headaches. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like they're almost all out of Delaware. So I wonder if you moved to Nevada for personal reasons or, or for legal reasons for insurance, because insurance law is very qualified. But but um, in fact, that'd be a great. Are you a writer? That'd be a great article for Dental Town. You should write a great article how you did it yourself. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to. Uh, uh, Get ready. You're going to get some stuff. I, I, I would love that. I, I, want, I want to end on this. Uh, I can't believe uh, we've already uh, gone an hour. But, um, you know, my four boys, their, their grandfather is the best because he grew up in the Depression. And when the guy finally had a million dollars cash and no debt, he still just lived like he was like the Depression was around the corner. And you and I have been around yeah. the block enough to see booms and bust. And a lot of these kids that are graduating in 2016, the last bus was 2008. So if you're in dental school and you just walked out at age 25, you're only 17 when that last bus hit. And it probably didn't affect their smartphone or the drive through at McDonald's. But what, what advice would you give some kid coming out of school, uh, starting out their own business? Um, what During a bust, what, what, what fed your family as opposed to during the boom when people were – borrowing money off their house to get veneers and full mouth reconstruction yeah. used to come in and say, I, I just want all the metal out and I just want a million dollar smile. Well, that was, that was 94 to 2000. And then March of 2000, it was like, I'll, I'll, I'll pull my teeth. If you give me 20 bucks, you know, I mean, right. so, yeah. so what, what advice would you give these millennials who probably didn't see a bust since they were in high school? Well, what, what's yeah. the long-term success for a dentist? You know, you know, for me, um, just getting out of school, I didn't have any any understanding of uh, of economics or budgeting or things like that. And there was a good year or two where I just spent money like crazy, just you know, going out and just doing fun stuff. Um, and so I would say the the first place is probably learn how to budget for yourself, learn how to save just automatically, so it's on cruise control. So you don't have to think about it. It's money that you don't even realize you have unless you have to physically look for it, you know. And then second of all, if you're starting your own business, you want to have you, that abundance thinking like you were talking about is important. But you also want to give yourself the best chance of success. So you're going to have a monthly nut to crack, right? And you want that nut to be as small as possible and, while you have great cash flow. Because if you don't have the cash flow there, or if you can't develop the cash flow, you're kind of sunk. Something bad happens in the economy, or you know, uh, who knows what's going to happen in the coming years. We hope it's going to be good, but if you don't have, uh, you know, an abundant local economy, cash flow is probably going to get hurt. So you need the cash flow as good as possible. You know, and and the economy, um, the national numbers don't even matter because. Uh... Who cares what the unemployment rate is if your town of 5,000 lost the only factory? I mean, right. you know, so you look at the boom. And, I mean, like the, America could be going through a boom. But if oil falls from 100 to 20, 
tell that boom to Texas, Louisiana, you know, Oklahoma. Yeah. So, so the the numbers for the American economy are they're just so um, don't apply to your hometown. And I mean, you know, yeah. it, it matters if your hometown is boom or bust. It doesn't really matter what the euro is doing. It doesn't matter what the dollar is trading at. It doesn't matter what the national debt rate is. It, it matters just your your local market. Um, so what about what would you tell a young kid about practice management? If they're coming out of school and they, they bought a practice. What, what would you tell them about um, practice management? Did, did you learn practice management? Did you? Was oh, that God, a big do any of us? Your, do they teach that in dental school now? When, <laughs> when I was in dental school, we didn't. We had, uh, I think, one. We had one practice management class. It was like an hour. That was and, it. And it <laughs> now was go, the, go spend a million dollars on a practice. Fairy. Yeah. She and rode you, in on a unicorn, and the tooth fairy yeah. jumped off the unicorn and taught us all practice management. It's it's horrible. The you know they can't expect uh, to have people spend all this money on dental school, and now it's a lot more expensive than when I graduated and when you graduated, and then send them out in the world. Uh, with no idea about business, they don't know how to read a spreadsheet. They they don't know how to you know use QuickBooks even or lead people, and that's ridiculous. So one of the worst uh, services dental schools do to people is kicking them out of dental school into the real world with it with no resources and no idea. So if if you're going out and buying a practice <clears throat> or going out and starting or joining a practice, before you spend a lot of money on CE, spend some money and time learning how to how to lead people and how to how to run a practice, and how, how and that's probably gonna. That? I mean, when we talked about implants, I got an MBA. Arun Garg, you what? I got an MBA. You went back and got an MBA. I did it while I was going to uh, while I was working full time. I worked for a big group, uh, and one of the biggest things that bothered me about it was a lot of a lot of why people do things in dentistry I couldn't understand and people couldn't explain it was just well this is how we always did it or this is how the person before us did it so it seemed like there were a lot of inefficiencies a lot of way a lot of things that I couldn't put my finger on that just didn't seem right so while I was working full-time I went to uh, Regis University and did their um, online MBA it's the same as their it's the same as their program in uh, if you actually go to the Regis University campus in Denver so all the courses are podcast or live streamed, and uh, you do all your homework and things over the internet. It was it was a great a great way to do it. I don't know that everyone needs an MBA, but it certainly helped. And then I got my MBA, and I decided, well, it doesn't make sense for me to work for somebody else. I'm starting my own place. So it's Regis dot edu r e g i s dot edu. Yep, it's a Jesuit university in Denver. I went to, did you, I went to Jesuit, I went to Creighton in Omaha. Oh, did, yeah? Did you go to a Jesuit college? No, no, I went to the University of Illinois for undergrad in Southern Illinois University. You went for to one Denver. of those pagan hedonist schools? That's right. That's <laughs> but, what it is. But you like the Jesuit Regis Online University for your MBA. I thought it was great. I thought it was really great. That, that was my, uh, that was my serious breakout point. I went back to school. In uh, 90, I think it was ni 1998, I graduated with my MBA. Uh, well, my practice is only 10 minutes from ASU. So after uh -huh. work on Mondays and Wednesdays from 6 to 10, I just drive. It was like 10.3 miles from my house to the, the, the parking garage. And I did that Monday and Wednesday from 6 to 10, year-round for two years. And it was the single biggest economic thing I ever did in my life. I mean, I look back at my career, and that's when... I finally took off. I mean, I just think it's yeah. so important. So you're listening to two dentists who both earned an MBA, and it don't matter if you're sitting in a brick building or online. I mean, just like Dentaltown. I mean, what I, what I love about Dentaltown the most is we put up these amazing courses for like 18 bucks, and then there's That's dentists fantastic. that don't have a dime, and they'll get in an airplane, and they'll fly to some other city, <laughs> and they'll pay more on the cab fare to go from the airport to their hotel and then drop three thousand dollars on a course. It's like you're 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 sure you didn't want to learn that at home for eighteen bucks on your oh, computer, yeah. really? But you're you're positive you know that about that. Town yeah. seems fantastic. Uh, I want I, you know, you have you have guys like Mark Collins, who's a townie who does sleep apnea stuff, and uh, <clears throat> he teaches actually in in uh, his course at Trump Hotel in Vegas, 
And it's one of the least expensive courses I've been to, but the content was absolutely fantastic. Well, he I mean, lives just, within driving distance. Now. He's in. Yeah, he's very close. Yeah. Now, where's he in Bullhead City or? I can't or, remember. It's somewhere. I think it's just across the border in Arizona or something. Yeah. So, how much did your did that online uh, MBA cost you at Regis? Uh, I think it was like twenty four thousand or twenty two thousand. I, I was going to take a local uh, executive MBA course through the local university, and there, there's a few local universities here, but they were like seventy five thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars. And I had a, I was talking to uh, one of my patients who got an MBA from Regis, but he actually, you know, he went to undergrad and graduate school there. And uh, he, he loved it and said, why don't you look? I heard they have an online MBA program. And I looked into it, and it looked really good. So and uh, so that's how I ended up doing that. Well, when people say, well, do you think I should get an MBA? And I said, well, well tell me this. W what's the difference between managerial economics and financial economics, like managerial accounting and financial accounting? And I'll say, what? I'll say, well, what, what's the difference between a statement of income and a balance sheet and a statement of cash flow? And they're like, what? I'm like, what's the difference between return on asset and return on I mean, you get an MBA, and you'll never be the same person again. You'll never think the same way again. You well, how, how is this? How is this for, yeah, wait, totally. So, um, you know, when you look at our practice management software, most mm -hmm. dentists, they love or hate their practice management software. But I don't think until you get an MBA, you realize how much you hate all practice management software. Oh, I know, and they're totally deaf. I mean, I have, I have done <clears> everything... I mean, I've literally flown down and seen Stan Bergman in his office. I've gone to Dentrix user meetings, and I mean, it's like yeah, I, mean, I use Dentrix. It's like so I use Dentrix. Here's how convoluted and screwed up it is. Oh so my god! I had people pressuring me. You know, when we had this stuff going on with uh, the local insurance group, and so I had people from this insurance, this big national insurance company, pressuring me to join their PPO. And I had a lot of local people pressuring me to join it. And I was like, I'm not joining it. So finally, I wanted to do an analysis. I wanted to do a breakdown of what the benefit or the cost would be to joining this PPO. And so I, in order to do it, I had to purchase a third-party software. I went to SikaSoft because I, I researched it and found that they had a third-party software that I could integrate into to Dentrix. I, and it ended up... Being like, yeah, it, it would have made me more, I would have been busier, but I would have had to produce $160,000 more to make up for the loss just to get back to my current year's production. $160,000 more. Now, I in the, that year, I had sat down with a bunch of other dentists I'm friends with to talk about, oh, how are you going to counteract this uh, new patient deal, you know, getting new patients with this new big 800 pound gorilla insurance in the in the community and a lot of them were like well i'm just going to join this ppo because i know i'm going to get more patients and then i'm going to get busier a hundred and sixty thousand dollars how does that how like how am i going to make that up just to get back to my current level of production how stupid would that have been so let, for me, me? Tell you, let me tell you my stan bergman story so finally <clears throat> you know he listened he's serious he's a great guy i mean he's just an amazing man personally so he sends this uh, lady that works for um, Shine with an MBA. She comes out. She meets me at Dental Town. We talk. So she goes back and she says, "Okay, well, I'm an MBA too. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna see what these dentists think." So she does like a questionnaire survey, sends it to a thousand dentists, asking them if they would be interested in all the things I'm talking about. You know, there, there it was it was like not even one percent said yes. And then on the survey, it's like, well, what would you like? I mean, there were more people who wanted to change the color and the font of their notes than everything you just talked about. Yeah, it's and, and it's, it's so like, and that, that's when I realized that, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I mean, there's towns in America that think Florida to water is a communist plot. And you're not going to change your mind. It's not? I mean, Are you serious? And, and my oldest sister is a Catholic nun. I, I can't give her a one-day seminar and make her into a Hindu or a Buddhist or, you know, I mean, you're, you're not going to change my oldest sister's mind on anything ever, period. And as long as all the dentists are telling Dentrix that, you know, that that it's great and that- they It'll don't... never happen, it'll never happen. Yeah. But here's why, it's because people don't know what they need I before know. they have a chance to use it. You know, just like when cell phones came on, so many people were like, why would I want that? You know, now they can't live with that. Or remember those PDA, those um, digital planners, like uh, they were kind of like an iPod. 
you know, people were still lugging around big binders with their schedules you know, before yeah. they had that. They didn't know you, they need somebody to make the decision and then people will love it and it'll explode and be great. But people don't know before, you know, it, it's, it's an experience people don't have. They're not used to having accounting software and practice management software together. They don't understand, since they don't have a, any business acumen, most dentists, including, you know, I, I include myself too, because I had to learn it all kind of on the fly and, and through my MBA, leadership and stuff was, and is something that's uh, totally kind of foreign to me. But now I can at least see the benefit and I want it. But most people don't have that. And so they're never going to, they're never going to demand it because it's something that doesn't exist. How can you demand something that doesn't exist? So as far as return on investment, you're, you're also a uh, CAD cam dentist. Uh, yeah. That, that, uh, that's it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and I think you have CIRAC and E4D, don't you? Nope. I just have the plan scan. The, 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 it used to be the E4D system. Now it's the plan scan fit system. It was, it was E4D out of Dallas, Texas, then plan Mecca out of Helsinki, Finland bought it. So now it's the plan scan. Plan scan. Yep, exactly. And, mm -hmm. uh, which um is that so so is that a return on investment what would you oh, say yeah. to someone who's saying uh i'm thinking about getting into uh e4d plan scan i think it's great but but i'll tell you why i think it's great you know uh there's so many reasons why people might choose to go into cad cam and if you just go into it if you're just like i'm gonna buy this system and use it it's it'll probably be frustrating and you won't get everything out of it you have to go into it with a plan and with a strategy. So it, for me, just the amount of, we, we do about two or three crowns a day on average, right? And so if you just take yeah, the cost huge. of, what's that? That's huge. I mean, if you use it two or three times a day, two, you do yeah. two or three single visit, same day crowns a day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, 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 but for details though, how much that is you time and how much that is dental <clears> time? <throat> Well, the reason I went with the system is because my time doesn't change. The patient flow changes and my assistant's time changes, but my time doesn't change. I sit there, get the patient numb or else my hygienist gets the patient numb and I come in, I prep the stuff and I leave. My assistants will scan the patient and, uh, and then they'll you know, digitally create the restoration. I might check it. Um, and th there's usually points along the way where I'll check it, but I'll go do something else while they're doing all that. And then I come back and we seek the restoration. So I, it's, I, I don't, I mean, I'll be honest. I don't check it because when you send an Empergum impression to your lab, are you going down there checking off the steps? No. I mean, a either your lab man makes the damn crown and it fits or it doesn't. Yeah. And, and, and it depends and on where they are. are making your yeah. dental assistant, um, a high tech employee and they, they i mean I, I i don't check i mean i i leave and then i come back to cement yeah we have my we have my assistants they go through um they go through a uh certification program through plan mecca to get certified for digital dentistry for digital is that, design. Is that only done in dallas uh it's done in chicago too but there's a there's a home study component and an in-office study component and then a live uh component so it's they have a uh, Plan Mecca University in Chicago, and then they have the one in Dallas. You know, I, I think they might have one other place uh, somewhere else, but it's really a fantastic program. I went to the and one they, so seriously. They, I went to the one in Helsinki, Finland. Well, why don't I get invited to that? You got to talk to Plan Mecca and get me invited. <laughs> oh my God, that is a that is a beautiful country. Yeah. Do you, I, do you have a plan scan fit? Or I, do you, don't, Sarah? I don't, but my best friend from uh, um, Creighton up the street went with that. I went with uh, Serona, but I'll tell you the secret to Finland. Uh, I'll tell you the secret to, to Scandinavia. I mean, seriously, it's the same story in uh -huh. Iceland, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland. During the winter is about four hours of sunlight a day. So yeah. the so what everyone does is they just are committed to their career ten hours a day, seven days a week during that whole winter. I mean, the the alternative is just sitting in your frozen home and drink all day. So you're either just going to come out of that winter a drunk, or have the most successful business known to man. I mean, those those people only know one thing: they just work. They work yeah. all day, every day. And you compare Scandinavia to the Mediterranean beach countries of Portugal and Spain and Italy and Greece. I mean, I mean, they, they, they outwork them two to one up north because of the weather. Yeah. 
I mean, mean when, could, it, when it's four hours of sunlight and minus 25 degrees, what are you going to do? You're just going to work. I'm, I'm going to move. Yeah, everybody just works. But anyway, it's a, so, so let me ask you an NBA question. Um, uh, why did you okay. go with E4D versus uh, Serona? So there were a few main reasons. I, I'd actually looked into buying the uh, Serona, the Sarek, originally, but there wasn't any competition for it. And I hate proprietary stuff. I just don't like being locked into one particular thing. And so I knew that there were a few other options on the horizon. So I just waited a couple of years. And you know, the other reason was, um, and, and Sarek works great. It's awesome. It's been around forever. The other thing was, uh, of all the people I know that have Sarek, and some of them are, you know, really into it and do a lot of things for with Sarek and stuff like that. They all do the design and everything themselves. None of them delegate it. I know there are people that do delegate it, but I didn't. I couldn't find anyone that I knew that delegated it. They all do, the doctor does every step of the process themselves. And for me, I didn't want that to be the situation. I wanted to be able to do other things, uh, you know, and and have my flow be my pay, my personal experience be very similar to what I do now. So when I got to uh, try out the software, I I thought that's something that my assistants can really. It's really super intuitive and visual, and I feel like my assistants can really pick it up and go with it. For one thing, it's it's not it's a very straightforward way to go. And it's very like, I think the process is very artistic and the assistants, my assistants anyway, they really love the ability, having the ability to do something creative like that. It gives them, uh, they, they really just kind of enjoy doing it and enjoy having that responsibility. So that's why I went with that system. I just felt like it was a lot more friendly for the team than the Sarek was. And uh, what the the isolate system when when they're in there working by themselves doing all this do you they and they need an assistant but you're not there you're you're in another room do you do you ever have them uh, use the isolate system I don't have the isolate I looked into getting it and it it looks like a great system we use uh, Mr Thirsty by uh, by Zerk and it's a single unit disposable <clears throat> um, it looks looks like it uh, it's a single unit disposable piece. Works the same Mr. way. Mr. Thirsty by yes. uh, Zirc Zirk. Mr. Thirsty by Zirc. Yeah. And they, you know, it's a really inexpensive way to get into that type of isolation. Huh, and uh, how did I like, not? I I I'm learning something on my own show. Instant isolation, one step. So now, when we, you look at that, does that look like the isolate? There's does. no light. Where, where is Zerk out of? Uh, it's, I don't know. It's an American company, I believe. Huh, how, they long, make, how long have you been using Mr. Thirsty? Oh, since it came out. Uh, it's been probably five years, three or four or five years, something like that. But the other thing we use uh, that when we don't have Mr. Thirsty or if we just need something quick uh, is we use these things called Logiblocks. They're mouth props with a hole for uh, low-speed suction. Um, and you still get really good isolation. Well, you get really good, uh, you know, suction and the patient can rest their jaw on it. It's, they find wow, it really it's funny. The, um, on their um, Twitter, at Zerk Dental, um, the, uh, their, their pinned tweet is, Dentist pours a gallon of water in his mouth to show the suction power of Mr. Thirsty One Step. <laughs> That's funny. So, so I'm sorry. What was the name of the the other thing you said? The um, the mouth. Oh, Logi Block. It's uh, it's more like a traditional mouth prop with a slot uh, where you can place How do you call it? like a loose suction. L. Uh, L O G I B L O C. I think, or Logi maybe B L O C K. Logi Block oh. Dental. And that's the name of the um, company. Yeah, Logi Block. It oh, it's made by Common Sense Dental. Yeah. That's something before uh, before Isolate was even around. That's what I was using. Wow, that's uh, you've got, you have all kinds of uh, pearls. You, <laughs> you do. You. I mean, those, those, those are new pearls. So, um, would you say um, would you say that buying a uh, CAD CAM is kind of like buying 
a piano or a guitar. You can't just buy a guitar and be a musician. You're going to have to buy this thing. You're going to have to really make a long-term commitment to it. Oh, so yeah. either you're going to get committed to it or you're going to do it like I did and make all my dental assistants get really committed to it because someone's yeah. got to learn something as equivalent as learning how to play a guitar or a piano. Would you agree it's like that? Totally. It's, it's exactly like that. You have to commit to it. You have to commit to learning the system and, and actually using it. And, uh, you know, I, I find that um, with a lot of things, we as dentists, we don't do that. We don't follow through. But it, committing to it and using it, it, it pays for itself. I mean, just if you go through the – like at one point I went through my, uh, my QuickBooks and looked at the cost of impression material <clears throat> and how much we'd save just in impression material and trays – um, by switching just to scanning, you know, even if we just look at the scanning portion and that pretty much pays for the, you know, for most of the unit, because we take a lot of impressions if we're not scanning, you know what well, I mean? Well, I think the impressions are, what would you say about 18 bucks for an impression? No, I think it's, well, I mean, it depends on what material you but use. What, what were you, what do you figure? I think it was, we're for a triple tray about like 25 bucks. Something did, that, like that. did that include the triple tray? Yeah, I mean, I think that the triple tray itself is like a buck or two, right? And yeah. the impression material is like another twenty or something. So I'm old school. I still uh, use Emperor gum, which is now which is made by SB, which is bought by 3M. You yeah. know, the old poly ether. Yeah, I think almost everybody uses the poly vinyl. And and then the lab bill. What was your lab bill? Uh, uh, what was your standard lab bill that's now replaced by CAD CAM? So you know the like the local labs, they're they're like around two hundred bucks a pop for a crown Jones. and even if you use you know you can these days you can get a nice zirconia crown zirconia is like the real popular crown these days you can get a uh, you can get them for as low as like 54 bucks a, a pop at labs that you have to send scans to they won't even accept uh, impressions so <clears throat> there are a lot of people are saying well if i can get a zirconia crown for 54 bucks why would i want to do it myself uh because that ends up being about the cost of a restoration by if you're using an office CAD cam, right? But the benefits from using an office CAD cam are, for one thing, patient flow and time. You can't make up for lost time, right? You can't make up for, a lot of people say it's crazy to think your, your cash flow is gonna get better when you get these units, but you're saving money on impression material. You're saving time uh, by doing it in one appointment so you don't have to set up and tear down another room for a cement right so that's another like what 15 20 minutes that your staff saving just by not having to turn over mm -hmm. stuff and the cost associated to turning over the room and it ends up being better for cash flow in the long run i'm sorry was that your question i don't know yeah well you said cash flow so you just you just put everyone to sleep because they're like cash flow that ain't a word I, i'm a doctor i never heard cash flow that ain't a word well, you know, if your if your lab bills, you know, the typical lab bill, I think for a crown is like what 150 bucks a unit or something like that. I don't, I, I you probably know that more but than you I gotta do. Make the temp, but you got to take the impression with the triple tray. You got to make a temp. Make temp material costs a lot too. The temp material is the same as an impression material, but don't you think? Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, gram, I don't really do it that much anymore. I so. mean, gram by gram, I mean, uh, you know, uh, an impression it's stuff. and a temporary is an expensive stuff, but I think it's. Um, yeah, I, I I think that number one. Well, you already said excellent points. Uh, you got someone's got to be committed to learn it. It's going to be either yeah. the dentist or the assistant, and um, but uh, and I agree with you. I I, I I think every dentist should get an MBA. I I don't know of a single dentist, lawyer, physician. Everybody I know, even if they work like up the street at like Intel, and they just amongst themselves say, "I'm going to go back and get my MBA." Um, when I was going there, there were two kids that worked at Bash's grocery store chain. They have 100 locations. They thought, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in management. I'm going to go get my MBA. I mean, it was a game changer for everybody in my class. I mean, I know who my classmates were in 98, 99. And, it was, and they, every one of them, and there's not one person that says, oh, that was a bad idea. They all say that was a game changer. Because once you learn how to think, and dentists, they think they're so smart. Dentists and physicians and lawyers, um, you ask anybody in the public, how would you describe a lawyer? Does anyone say humble, nice, good listener? Or do they just say arrogant, conceited, know-it-all? And you only know what you know. You don't know what you yeah. don't know. And everybody that gets an MBA 
thinks differently the rest of her life. And you can look at those surveys that poor Henry Shine has sent out to all their Dentrix users, and you can just look at the survey results that they have no idea what they don't know. I mean, the most important data they could learn is, you know, they're signing up for eight to 12 different PPOs. And when you go in there and do the books, they're anywhere from making money to losing their shirt, and they have no idea which ones are which. And when no, you you know, for me to find out, for me to find out that information, I had to go to a whole different company to get software to help me figure it out. That should all be something that the practice automatic. management software automatically helps you do. And it, and, would change, and it would change the schedule because if if the assistant sees she's on this HMO or PPO or whatever, and she schedules an hour for a procedure, and it instantly went red and said, "You do this, you'll lose forty-seven bucks." So then she moves it down to forty-five minutes. Says, "Okay, now you're doing it for free." So then she moves it down to 30 minutes. Say, okay, now the doctor will make 40 bucks on the deal. And then the doctor walks in and goes, well, I, I can't do this in 30 minutes for that. I, I can't do it. I need an hour. Okay, doc. Right. Well, then drop the plan. Or, yeah. or maybe instead of an MOD composite, maybe you'll go back to amalgam. Or maybe, maybe you know, but if you just But know then you the can score, make the decisions. You can't make decisions without data, without information. Yeah. So how do we get this to change? Because right now there's no practice management software that has this feature, right? Well, there's I no. Mean, I, I do a daily free podcast, and I, I, I've said this to everyone. I've got Stan Bergman coming on the show. Is he scheduled? Yeah, Stan's scheduled. So uh, it would be the only Dentrist would be the only practice management dude uh, I, platform that was actually built to manage if they had that. But it's sad right? because they, they invited me. I, I don't know why they invited me to their users conference last year. And they're like, really? Really? You're <laughs> going to invite me to your users conference? So I'm sitting up there and, I, and the guy opens up with the fact that we all, every, every consultant knows that of all the features and all the practice management software system, whether it be EagleSoft, Dentrix, SoftEnt, probably only 15% of the features are used in any office. So yeah. most offices, if you go in and look at the report generator, they don't even use 85% of the features. So every year, a bunch of dentists send in more requests for more features, and they're just chasing. It's, it's, it's like a nuclear arms race for themselves. And then what that does is when you go to a well-run company like the Hyatt or the Hilton or whatever, they have got rid of all the shit so yeah. that they can get an employee off the street. So there's only like eight things to check you in at the Hyatt or the Hertz Rent-A-Car. So they're into processes. So they can take someone off the street with a glowing personality and they'll get it right every time because in order to check you in for your appointment, I have to do these steps or I can't go to the next step. Now, mm -hmm. Dentrix is the, the opposite. It's got 40 million features. So she's sitting on this computer overwhelmed like a deer a looking at headlights. It's like complete confusion. Like I say, they're in a nuclear arms race with themselves of useless features that nobody knows. And you yeah. say, and, and then it's not hooked up to accounting so you have but can I get it in the color blue? Yeah, and, and then you're dealing with a bunch of dentists who <clears> want to stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning arguing about which bonding agent is the best. Yeah. And, and, and what's better, Generation 7, 8, 9, 10, or Elemental P? I mean, it's a... Uh, you know, it's like Google. If you look at Google, there's people that will complain to Google if they have too much stuff on the dashboard, right? They, they Google limit. That's why Google isn't cluttered when you go to search something on Google. That's what we need. We need simplification so that so that stuff actually gets used. You know, yeah. the, the important data is collected and stuff's actually used instead of having it be so schizophrenic and mm -hmm. and screwed up. But but so but my point is, it's never going to happen because dentists are never going to clamor for it, right? Like you said, they argue about we argue about what what the best bonding agent is. So we need something that doesn't exist, and you can't go. You know when. Uh, when Apple came out with the first iPod or the first iPhone, it didn't exist. People didn't didn't have it, and, but they they took the risk and said, "I'm going to do it." Why can't we? Why can't we talk to Stan? Well, well, um, you know, you know what's what's the game changer though is they're losing four thousand dollars a year on their paycheck. They've gone from basically two nineteen to one seventy four, and they're and that is the best thing going for dentistry because now they're starting to stand up and say, "What." What's going on? How come it's I, one of the reasons we get manipulated so easily by insurance companies. They told me that you could be for damn eight sure. Years, I'd own a Porsche. Yeah. And, and now, so now they're paying attention. I mean, I think the only thing to get them to pay attention has been this. And I think every single, I think by the time their average income goes down to 150, 
they're actually going to start getting practice management militant. I mean, you don't go to school eight years to make a buck and a quarter. And uh, so I, I think I think this is getting their attention. It's just like um, economic policy. They, they never think about it when there's a bubble. They always think about it when there's a bust. Yeah. You know? But, hey, man, seriously, thank you so much for coming on my thank show. Thank you. And uh, I, I would lo- I would love it. You ever want to write an article of Dental Town Magazine? I, I think the benefits of a loyalty program over just advertising and burning and churning new patients that never come back. I mean, the loyalty program, you know, I mean, I've always said I'd rather copy the big boys. I'd rather copy Sam's Club and Costco uh, than, uh, than, you know, reinvent the wheel. And they, they're they, successful. And, and all Why the big failure? boys, all the big boys – think loyalty programs and membership clubs are more important than advertising marketing. When's the last time you saw a Sam's club or a Costco ad on TV? I don't think I've ever seen one, right? They put all their money into loyalty. So you're onto something there, buddy. All right. Well, Hey, thank you very I much. Happy, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. The whole time. And you didn't even eat a piece of cheese and you live in Wisconsin. <laughs> my That's God. True. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on my show and you have a rocking hot day. All right. You too.